presentation in Unit 2. This is entitled Energy and Thermodynamics. It's going to be an introduction to energy, which we're going to use in subsequent units, and it's also going to give us a brief introduction to thermodynamics, which we will uh, see again in the second semester. So, in times of great stress or adversity, it's always best to keep busy to plow your anger and your energy into something positive. So, the learning goals are that you be able to understand the various types of energy that are common in chemistry, use the laws of thermodynamics to check for uh, chemical systems, and then you should be introduced to and be able to use Hess's law, and that you be able to relate heat, change, and temperature, and fit change in phase. So, the first thing is we need to look at energy. Now, energy is traditionally defined as the ability to do work. In a physics class, a lot of times you use the formula W equals FD, and that's a really common formula for physics. Now, in chemistry, it's not so useful because we're generally not worried about force. Okay, so we're usually not worried about force and we're usually not worried about distance. But what we are worried about is pressure and change in volume. So in chemistry, we're going to refer to work or energy as pressure times the change in volume. Now, just, just to get the unit straight right away, a lot of times in chemistry, we're going to see change in volume as liters. Okay, But whenever we use liters, in order to make the units match up, we need to use kilopascals instead of regular pascals. So whenever we're doing an energy calculation with this work equals pressure times change in volume, we really need to make sure that we're putting it in units of kilopascals in liters. So we see an example. It says how much work is done expanding a gas at 1.4 atmospheres from 25 to 300 liters. So the first thing that we realize is we're going to have to do some conversions here. So the first conversion that we're going to have to do is we have 1.4 atmospheres. So we're going to have to say 1.4 atmospheres, 1 atmosphere is 101.325 kilopascals. Now when we multiply that out, we get 141.855 kilopascals. The other thing we need to do is we need to convert, uh, we can go ahead and leave liters as it is because we've, we've used kilopascals. So because of that, we can say that the change in volume is 300 minus 25, which is 275. So when I'm trying to do the work overall, I would say work is equal to the, the pressure times the change in volume. This is pressure. Okay, now when you take these and multiply them by one another, you get one, um, 141.85 times 275, and that gives you the energy, which in our case is, um, when you multiply everything out, is 39,010 joules. Okay, now one other important thing we're going to have to look at is, what is the direction of the work or what is the work doing in relation to the system? Now if you look at it, the work in this particular case is expanding. So as a result of the system expanding, what that means is whatever's in the system actually loses this much energy because there's work done in making the system bigger. In order to make the system bigger, you're actually going to have the system lose some energy as it expands. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the next type of energy we have is kinetic energy. Once again, in physics, this is the traditional formula that you see. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half the mass times the velocity squared. Now, in chemistry, this is a useful relation, too. We do use this to some extent, but a more common version that you see in chemistry is this equation right here. This equation right here is kinetic energy is equal to three-halves, not one-half, but three-halves. This right here is called the Boltzmann constant. And then you have right here the temperature. The temperature needs to be in units of Kelvin. So what this says is that the kinetic energy of a system is directly proportional to the kinetic energy. So if you were to graph it, you would have something like, hey, this is temperature. Hey, this is kinetic energy. It would be a straight line. Now, the reason why it would be a straight line is this right here is a constant. This right here is a constant. So when you multiply the temperature by a constant, it's always going to be the same value going up. Now, the Boltzmann constant is... 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. That's what the Boltzmann constant is in this particular case. Now you can relate these two things together if you'd like to. You can relate these two things together and they would allow you to figure out the velocity of an individual molecule. Okay, So that's what we have here. It says 
determine the average velocity of a nitrogen molecule at minus 200 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we realize is this is in Celsius, so I'm going to have to convert it to Kelvin. I convert Celsius to Kelvin by taking my Celsius value and adding 273 to it, and I get my temperature to be 73 degrees, or not 73 degrees, just 73 Kelvin. We don't say degrees whenever we have Kelvin. Next, I know I have the Boltzmann constant, which I would say is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd. Now in this case it actually wants me to find the velocity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my two kinetic energy formulas and I'm going to set them equal to each other. I'm going to say 3 halves kt is equal to 1 half mv squared. <clears throat> okay, so now once you've done this you need to go ahead and say okay well what's the mass of a nitrogen molecule and a lot of you will go oh 28. And that's right, that's 28 grams for one mole. And I'm not interested in one mole, I'm interested in on a per molecule basis. So because of this, you have to actually multiply it out and figure out what the mass of an individual nitrogen molecule is. <clears throat> I've gone ahead and done the math for you, but I'd like you to see if you can figure out how I got this. And it's 4.65 times 10 to the minus 27th. You also have the velocity squared, and then we also have 3 halves, and then you have your numbers over here, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd, and then I'm going to go ahead and put the temperature out here just so it fits. So now the only thing you don't have is the velocity. You would rearrange these equations. You can get rid of both of these 2s right away. And the reason why you can do that is you've got twos on both sides. You would multiply everything out. You divide both sides by 4.65 times 10 to the minus 27th. And what that'll do is that'll allow you to start to isolate V. Remember, don't forget that once you divide by 4.65 times 10 to the minus 27th, after you do that, you have to take the square root of that because remember this is a V squared term. And once you've done that, you get the velocity is about 806 meters per second. Just pretty fast still, even when it's moving, um, even when it's minus 200 degrees Celsius. Okay, next we have the electric energy equation. Now this is one you may not be familiar with from earlier classes. Uh, this is the electric energy. It's just a variation of Coulomb's law. Remember Coulomb's law is KQ1, Q2 over D squared. In other words, it's the force, opposites attract. Well, remember we had the equation that work is equal to force times distance. So if I just take this force and I multiply it by distance, Okay, well force times distance, that's a type of energy, and force times distance, that's going to cancel the square term out. That's where this term comes from. So one of the other common versions that you see is electric energy. Next, we have uh, this one right here, and it says uh, how much work is required to bring two protons uh, to within one femtometer of one another. So you have two protons and a helium atom. So they get very, very close to each other within one femtometer. One femtometer is one times 10 to the minus 15th meters. So that right there is our distance value. We have two protons. So the Q1 and the Q2 values are actually the same. They're 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. That's the charge of an individual proton or the charge of an electron if you make it negative. So now I can plug into my formula. I can say that the energy is equal to K, which my K value is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. If you didn't know that, it's on the previous slide. And then times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. And I'm going to square that term. Because it's the same thing as multiplying 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. Now I'm going to take those and I'm going to divide them by 1 times 10 to the minus 15th. Now here's where some people who have had physics will actually screw up. They're so used to squaring this bottom term to find force that they don't realize that to find energy you don't square that term. We write it exactly as it is. So once we do that, we put it in our calculator and you can say that it's 2.3 times 10 to the minus 13th joules. And you may be thinking that's an extremely small amount of energy. And it looks like it, but remember the energy for visible light is like 10 to the minus 19th. So the energy required to move these protons that close to each other is something on the order of a million times more than the energy it takes to just move those protons closer together. So 
Next, we have the units of energy. Uh, the standard unit of energy is the joule, but you also tend to see things in kilojoules. More specifically on the AP test, you tend to see things in kilojoules per mole. And the reason for it is just, it's just easier as far as not writing zeros. Sometimes you'll see things in calories and kilocalories. Um, calories, remember, if it has a capital C, actually means a thousand small calories. So whenever you refer to a Coke or some sort of food serving, those 69 capital C calories actually refers to 69,000 calories in, certain, in terms of science. Um, you're supposed to have 200,000 small C calories a day, so it's, a, it's what's called a dietary calorie. Um, a lot of times in Europe, you'll see things in kilojoules per mole or kilojoules per kilogram. This is a Coke label from, um, from a Europe European country. You see 180 kilojoules is what you see. Okay, so next, we need to define the system. You should know what this is. Okay, the system is the collection of molecules that are being studied. So if I have a beaker and I'm looking at the stuff of the beaker, that beaker represents the system. The system can be defined as whatever you want it to be, whatever you're interested in. But generally speaking, you would like to isolate the system from everything else that's around it. So I wouldn't want to say the system is this molecule in the beaker because I can't really isolate it from everything else. So the system is what you can isolate and what you're trying to study. Everything that is not the system is what we call the surroundings. The surroundings can be things like heat, they can be things like other molecules that are outside of it, um, it, could be other, it can be just about anything that is not the system. Now the first law of thermodynamics says that heat and work are forms of energy that cannot be created or destroyed but flow into or out of a system. So in other words it says energy can't be created or destroyed, only converted from one to form to another. That should sound extremely familiar. We call that the law of conservation of energy, or LOS. The law of conservation of energy says you can't create energy, you can't destroy it, you can only convert it from one form to another. Now, we need to define some other terms here as well, like heat and work and internal energy. Okay, this is an equation. It's, it's the equation for the first law of thermodynamics. So this is still the same thing that we were talking about before, the first law of thermodynamics. This says the change in the energy of a system. That's called the change, delta is change, in internal energy. So the energy that the system possesses is equal to the Q value, which is the heat, plus the W value, which is the work. Now this is generally speaking a very, very easy formula. Where it gets tricky is when you have to look at the direction. It's really easy for Q. If you add heat to a system, okay, the heat adds energy to the system. Okay, there's, nobody really has a problem with heat. If you remove heat from the system, it removes energy from the system. Where people get confused is when you look at W. W is positive. This value is a positive number when the system is compressed or whenever you take the system and you squeeze the system down into a smaller value. When you squeeze the system down into a smaller value or you compress it, you are adding energy to the system. You're adding potential energy, your potential energy to expand at that point. If you allow the system to expand, you're actually removing energy from the system. Okay, so the system is more likely to contract at that point. So we say that it's a negative W whenever you have a system that expands. So there are certain conditions that we need to be uh, on the lookout for whenever we're taking a test, and they're key terms that you should just, you have to know the term. Whenever you have isobaric, baric means referring to pressure because the original unit for pressure we had was the bar. So whenever you have isobaric conditions, what that means is that you have a constant pressure. What that allows us to say is we can take the delta U equals Q plus W and we can expand it into pressure times change in volume. Now one of the things that whenever you're doing a reaction, most reactions that take place in the atmosphere are under isobaric conditions. When you tend to have things that are not isobaric conditions are when they are capped. Whenever you put a cap on there, you or you don't you prevent the system from being able to um, exchange with the atmosphere. That's generally speaking when you have isobaric conditions, okay? Or whenever you don't have isobaric conditions. Excuse me. Anything that is open, if you were to open this container, if it was open to the atmosphere, you would generally have isobaric conditions. The next one is called an adiabatic condition. Um, adiabatic conditions are one in which you're, there is no heat that is transferred between the system. So I have my system, 
and I could have something be really, really, really hot right here, but none of that heat energy can get into the system because it's isolated. Okay, this is an adiabatic condition. It's very, very difficult to do. This right here is an example of an experimental system in which you were trying to have an adiabatic condition. You have the experiment that's occurring here, and it's under this this really thick insulated material and it's separated from other things but that right there is an example of adiabatic conditions well if no heat is transferred then the value of Q goes away and our internal energy is due to just our pressure and our change in volume so one of the ways scientists will investigate the relationship between reactions is you'll actually set a system up in which you react it and no transfer of heat is possible that way you've kind of eliminated one of the variables and you can see what happens in terms of pressure and volume Next, you have a calorimeter. A calorimeter is a, is a device that's used to measure heat. Now, the simplest calorimeters are one in which you have some sort of container, some sort of substance, usually water, and then you have a thermometer that's right here. So whenever you take something and a reaction occurs, you can actually measure the temperature change of the water, and using the temperature change of the water, you can actually see how much heat is released. Now, a lot of times they will surround these things with sort of styrofoam or some sort of other insulator to prevent the heat from spreading to the surroundings. The next condition we have is something called an isochoric condition. Isochoric conditions are ones in which you have a constant volume. Now, remember, our definition of work was work equals pressure times change in volume. If the volume is constant, the change in volume is zero. Well, if the change in volume is zero, then the change in internal energy is just due to the heat of a system. There's a special device for this, it's kind of diagrammed out right here. It's called a bomb calorimeter. A bomb calorimeter is one in which the reaction takes place in a sealed steel container that is incapable of expanding. And what you can do is you can set the conditions where the reaction cannot expand. And once you do that, if you prevent the system from expanding, all the energy of the reaction is transferred to heat. Well, then you can set a thermometer up here and you can say you can measure that value and you can measure the amount of energy that this particular system had. So here's a special case. Um, whenever you have an isochoric or a bomb calorimeter, you can have the specific heat of the calorimeter times the temperature change. So this right here may be surrounded with one kilogram of water, and any temperature change of a certain amount will result in a very specific change for the reaction. The last one we have is an isothermal condition. Isothermal condition means that it's constant temperature. Now remember, temperature is an indicator of how much kinetic energy a system has. So whenever we say there's a change in, there's no change in temperature, we say the change in internal energy of a system is zero. And generally speaking, what you have at that point is Q is equal to negative W. So you kind of rearrange the equation. You say if you're going to add heat to the system, it's going to go straight to expanding the system. Kind of like a balloon. If you have a balloon and you heat it up, it goes into expanding the system. So this example says a hot air balloon expands from 2,000 liters to 3,000 liters. So we have a pretty big balloon here. Uh, when 500,000 kilojoules of energy is added under isobaric conditions, what is the change in internal energy of the system? So I'm ultimately trying to find delta U. And I know delta U is Q plus W. Now I know right away that I'm adding a bunch of energy. Now that energy is going to be heat. So what I can say is I can say delta U is equal to 500,000 and then I'm going to add three more zeros because this right here was kilojoules. Now, I need to add the work component into this. So if I were to look at it, my change in volume is very easy to identify. It's a thousand liters. But what's more difficult for me to look at is to realize a lot of people will stop and say, but I don't have the pressure. Yes, you do. Because if you're in a hot air balloon, what can you say is going to be the pressure? It's going to be atmospheric pressure, which means the pressure is going to be 101.325 kilopascals. At that point, <clears throat> you have pressure times volume, or pressure times change in volume, excuse me, 101.325 times our volume, which is a thousand, and you multiply that out. Now the last thing that you need to be aware of, and this is what gets people every time, is they will just add these two terms together. But realize, you have expanded the balloon. If you expand the balloon, this work term is negative. If the work term is negative, you don't add, 
you subtract. So because of that, the value ends up being like 4.99 times 10 to the 8th joules. You subtract because you have to be aware of whether you're, you're uh, compressing the system or expanding the system. <clears throat> Example says calculate the heat added to a system that expands under STP from 20 liters to 50 liters under isothermal conditions. Now a lot of people will look at this and say that can't possibly happen. How can you add heat to a system and have isothermal conditions? Remember that there are two things that you can do when you add heat to a system. You can change the temperature or you can allow the system to expand. And you see it expanding in the change in volume. So you can say that the change in volume is 30 liters. Now remember, since the system is expanding, right away you know the work is going to be negative. So I can say, okay, under STP, that lets me know that the pressure is going to be 101.325. Now I'm trying to figure out the Q value. So I'd say delta U is equal to Q plus W. But based on my system, isothermal conditions, I know delta U is zero. Because of that, I can say Q equals uh, negative W. Now remember, W was already negative. So because of that, I'm going to have a negative negative W. Because of that, it cancels out. So the heat that is added to a system goes explicitly to making the system expand. So I can say that the heat is equal to 101. 0.325 times 30. When you multiply those two values out, you get something like 3,040 joules. Next, we need to talk about the difference between an endothermic reaction and an exothermic reaction. Whenever you have an endothermic reaction, the reaction requires heat as a reactant. So if you were to look at it, I would have a reaction like A plus B goes to C, and if this is an endothermic reaction, energy is a reactant. So you can think of the energy as being there. If you have an exothermic reaction, it would be A plus B goes to C, and then you would have energy as a product. Now regardless, most chemical reactions are going to require some sort of energy input. Okay, It could be a very small energy input. It could be energy that's just provided by the um, the system itself. But what you see here is you see an endothermic reaction. You require a large amount of energy and then it falls back down and there is more energy going up. So because of that this would be considered to be an endothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction would look very similar. You would have an increase in energy it would cap off and then it would drop way back down. So you would actually have a release of energy where the energy is lower than it initially was. Now whenever we do what are called enthalpy calculations, which is delta H term, if you have a positive value, it means an end, it's an endothermic reaction. A positive value means energy is a, is a reactant. A negative value means that energy is a product. And that's something you need to be really familiar with. If it's a negative a negative enthalpy, that means it has produced heat. If you have a positive enthalpy value, it means it requires heat. Okay, so a state function. A state function is just basically defined as it depends on the state of the system. So internal energy depends on temperature, volume, and pressure. So because of that, we call them state functions. Now it doesn't actually matter how you get from here to here, so long as you get from here to here. It's a lot like the idea of displacement in physics. The idea that all you need to do is get from the starting point to the the ending point, and it doesn't matter how you get there. It's the same basic idea with a state function. It doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there. Now, enthalpy is a state function. It's actually a combination of three state functions. And so because of that, you have enthalpy is equal to the internal energy plus the pressure plus the volume. Now, the enthalpy is really hard to calculate. A lot of times people will just say that it's heat, and it's kind of the same thing as heat. Because remember, we have this, this U value is heat plus work, but it's, it's a little bit more defined than that, and it's actually kilojoules per mole. Okay, It's not just in joules, it's going to be on a per mole basis. So, when we look at this, we say 
Calculate the change in enthalpy for a 1 liter bomb calorimeter that registers a change in internal energy of this as the pressure increases from this. So we know I have a constant volume. Now notice that this particular formula didn't say what is the change in volume. So a lot of people will say, well, the volume is going to cancel out. No, this is no longer calculating the work that's done. Okay, This is a different type of thing. There is no work done in the expansion, but in this particular case, we're looking at enthalpy. So we would say delta H, the change in enthalpy, is equal to the change in internal energy plus the change in pressure times the volume. Why not the change in volume? Because there is no change in volume. So if you were to look at this, we would say, okay, the change in internal energy is 180 joules, because it tells me the change in internal energy is 180 joules. Now also you have the pressure. We have a change in pressure of 0.4 atmospheres. Now remember, we're not going to leave it in atmospheres. We're going to go ahead and change it to kilopascals, which is 101.325 kPa. That needs to mul be multiplied by 1 liter in order to change it into the correct unit. So at this point, you would have a value of, um, when you multiply everything out, 220.53 joules. Now, generally speaking, enthalpy is reported on a joules per, per mole basis. But since that I, I didn't have anything saying a mole was combusted, I can't really say it's 220.53 joules per mole. A lot of times on this question, you'll say, 0.5 grams of NaCl was combusted, or something along those lines, and you would have to take this value, change it into moles, and then find the joules per mole basis. So the enthalpies of reaction, okay? The enthalpy of a reaction is, delta is always products minus reactants, or final minus initial. So enthalpy is an extensive property. It is going to depend on how much is there. Um, Whenever you have a reversible reaction, the, in, the change in enthalpy is going to be the same. So, for example, if you have um, salt goes to Na plus plus Cl minus. And let's say the change in enthalpy in that case is going to be, I don't know, 100. That means you can also write Na plus plus Cl minus is going to be negative 100. It's the same enthalpy of reaction, forward and backward. It's just the sign is going to change depending on whether you need energy as a product or energy as a reactant. Okay, so the enthalpy does change on the state of the reaction. And delta H should follow a balanced chemical equation. Every time you write a balanced chemical equation, you should have enthalpy information there as well. <clears throat> now, that might not always be an option on an assignment, but if it is an option, make sure you put it there. So it says calculate the enthalpy of formation for liquid water given that the given vapor then determine if the process is endothermic or exothermic. So if you were to look at this, I'm trying to say liquid water given the vapor. So I'm starting out with the gas. <clears throat> and then I'm going to the liquid. So this is what it's doing. So in order to do this, I just have to do products minus reactants. So I would say, what's the product? Well, the product in this case is liquid water. So I take that and I subtract the reactant, which is 241.82. Now if you look, it's a minus minus a negative. So we're going to do plus a positive. And what you end up with whenever you do that is you end up with a value that is a negative 43.98 kilojoules per mole. Now what that means is that the process of turning water into a liquid is actually an exothermic reaction that it's actually producing heat as it changes state. Now, people have a hard time with that because they say, no, 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 no. When water cools down, that's when it becomes a liquid. That's true. But the process of it actually is an exothermic reaction. It's actually producing heat when it becomes a liquid. And that should make sense because you should be familiar with the opposite. Whenever you have a liquid water that goes to a gas by perspiration, you don't get hotter whenever you perspire. It's the evaporation of the liquid actually takes the heat with it so the reverse is an endothermic reaction so since sweating and perspiration is a cooling process it's an endothermic reaction it takes heat then we would expect the opposite reaction to be exothermic next it says calculate the enthalpy of reaction as calcium carbonate deco decomposes into calcium oxide and calcium dioxide the first thing that you have to do is you have to write a balanced equation this one's relatively easy because it just 
it's CaCO3, and it's going to go into CO2 plus CaO. There's no balancing anything, but just realize if there was a 2 here, you would have to multiply that value by 2. Now there's no 2 in this balanced equation, so we'll just leave it as is. So we do products minus reactants. The products in this case, <clears throat> the products in this case are calcium oxide and CO2. Those two numbers are added together. Now a lot of people will make, make the mistake of subtracting and all that kind of stuff. Remember, it is the sum of the products. So both products added together, which is going to give us a value of like minus 1,000 roughly. Okay, so it's going to be minus 635 and then plus minus 393.5. <clears throat> and then that whole thing minus a minus 1206.9. Whenever you do this, you end up with a reaction of or a total enthalpy of reaction of 178.21 kilojoules per mole. And since it is a positive value, you can say that this is an endothermic reaction. So energy would have to go on the reactant side. To Hess's law. Now Hess's law was what we were talking about earlier whenever we said we have one state of the system and we have another state of the system. And the difference between this and this and this is the same. It doesn't matter how you get from one point to another. It matters what you start with. It matters what you finish with. So in this case, it says the reaction depends only on the amount of reactants and not the process. So the change in enthalpy is the sum of the individual changes. So the overall reaction that I have is this. Iron solid plus three halves of chlorine yields FeCl3. Now that's the reaction right there. Now if you were to look at this on a uh, individual step process, and this is going to be important when we talk about ki kinetics, you can break this process down into two different steps. The first step would be iron forming with chlorine to form iron 2 chloride. Now once you've done that, the process of iron 2 chloride reacting with another chlorine molecule to form iron 3 chloride is another step. So you need to get to the, used to the idea of chemical reactions occurring in more than one step. You have step one, and you have step two. Now, if you're trying to find the overall reaction, the overall reaction, the total, is just the sum of those two particular steps. So this is going to be a really important idea for us to build on in kinetics. Kinetics will say, okay, well, if this one happens slow, and this one happens fast, well, how fast can this reaction occur? or if both of these are fast, or if both of these are slow. And so that's where we're going to eventually with these things. Now, here's an example of a question. It says, what is the enthalpy of reaction given this? Now, the first thing that you should realize is that there's an error with this particular question in the fact that it is not balanced. You had multiple, you had too many um, oxygens that are there. So now at this point, you need to balance the equation. When you balance the equation, actually, hold on a second, that's not right. We'll balance it as we go. So the first thing you realize is you've got several steps here. These are three different reactions that it can occur. Whenever you have these three different reactions, you've got to figure out some sort of combination of these reactions to equal the top reaction. So if you look, I have SCS2, and that right there is a reactant. The only other place that CS2 is a reactant or is, is in the equation is right here, but it's listed as a product. So what I really need to do is I need to have this reaction right here, but I need to have it in the opposite way, in where this is a reactant, not a product. So I need to flip this reaction around. Now remember what we talked about earlier, that you can reverse a reaction, and when you reverse the reaction, all you have to do is change the sign. So this is no longer 87.9, it's now negative 87.9, because I flipped the reaction around. When you do that, you get this. Oh, I have, I should say, 2S solid. Now, what I have now is I have two solid sulfurs. Now, the problem with this two solid sulfurs is that's not really what I want. I don't want two solid sulfurs. So the next step would be to find a reaction in which you have... Um, solid sulfur and it turns into one of the products and you see that right here in this middle step. This middle step has solid sulfur plus oxygen goes to sulfur dioxide and you have the enthalpy of reaction there. Now remember this is on a per mole basis. I have two sulfurs here. 
If I have two sulfurs here, I need two sulfurs here. So I need to take this thing and I need to multiply this thing out. When I multiply this thing out, um, it's no longer going to be negative 296.8 because for this reaction, I need two of these reactions to occur. So it would be 296.8 times 2. Now, the first reaction is actually great. I actually have the solid carbon and the solid carbon, and I have the oxygen, and then I get a product that I want. Now, one of the ways that you can actually look at this thing is you can start to cross things off. I have solid carbon on the right. I have solid carbon on the left. I have carbon dioxide on the, um, on the right, and it's one of the products that I want. I have this SCS2L, that's something that I want. See how it matches up there? And then I have this solid sulfur. Don't want it, it's crossed out here. Now, you have CS2, well that's this, so we have this, CS2 is there. We have our CO2, which is there. We have our SO2, which is there. And remember there's two of them because we multiplied this whole thing by two. Now remember we said this, this top equation was originally not balanced and it wasn't. It was because there were supposed to be three oxygens and we should have figured that out at the beginning. But So now everything that's not in this top equation, notice how it cancels out. And so all I'm left with is the stuff that I want. So you have these numbers that are left. To find the enthalpy, enthalpy of the overall reaction, all you need to do is add them together. So you'd have minus 393.5 plus minus 296.8 times 2 plus a negative 87.9. You'd add all those up and you would have the enthalpy of reaction, which I will leave for you to do. And you see another example here of enthalpies of reaction. So you have a table of enthalpies of formation. So it can say, hey, these are the enthalpies of formation. Tell us what the enthalpy of the reaction is. Remember, the enthalpy of reaction is just products minus reactants. So if you look, it says this is the kilojoules per mole. The fact that I have nine waters would mean that I don't have to take nine and multiply it by what water is. Okay, the fact that I have five of these boron trihydrides means I don't have to take that number and not have to multiply it by five. And that's what you see over here. You're multiplying each one of them, and then you're subtracting the products minus the reactants. The last thing we need to talk about is the specific heat equation. You should be familiar with this from first-year chemistry and from physics. It's Q equals CM delta T, and you just go ahead and plug it in to find the specific heat capacity. Remember, you have the change in temperature that's there. You should also be familiar with the change of phase equation. It's very similar. It's just Q equals ML, where L represents the what's called the latent heat of transition, whether it's fusion or vaporization. Now, so here's some examples. This is determine the final temperature of a one kilogram sample of water if the sample is initially at 273 before being subjected to 100,000 joules of heat. So you have Q is 100,000. You have M is 1. You have the change in temperature uh, is what you're trying to find. You're trying to find the final temperature, minus 273. So that represents the change in temperature. Uh, and then finally, you have the specific heat of water, which it doesn't specifically say, but is 4,184 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius, or 4.184 joules per gram, however you want to look at it. Since we have a mass of 1 kilogram, I went ahead and left it in kilograms. Use the formula Q equals CM delta T. Once you do that, you'd say 100,000 equals 1 times 4 point, or excuse me, 4184 times TF minus 273. Divide both sides by 4184, and then you add 273 to it, and you get a final temperature of about 296 degrees. And that, oh, excuse me, it's not degrees, it's just 296 Kelvin, because we don't say degrees Kelvin, we just say Kelvin. Okay, next, we have another example, it says how much energy is required to convert 5 kilograms of 20 degrees Celsius water into uh, steam, and so we have to find the heat, and that's going to equal to the specific heat times the change in temperature, plus the heat that's required to change the phase. So in this case, we're dealing with water still, so this is 4184. I'm going to change colors just so it's easier to see. Um, we're going to have 5 kilograms there, and then our change in temperature. You'd say, I'm at 20 degrees Celsius. Remember, whenever you're at 20 
degrees Celsius, water will transition to steam at 100 degrees. So you'd say it's 100 degrees. And then you'd have 5 times 2260000. Now, one of the interesting things when you look at this is that the amount of energy required to, um, to heat 5 kilograms of water by 80 degrees is about 1,673,600 joules. The energy required to take the um, that exact same mass of water and convert it into steam is going to be about 11,300,000 joules. Now you should realize that this is a lot more than this because what's happening is you are breaking the intermolecular bond, or excuse me, not bonds, the intermolecular forces that are holding these molecules together. When you're in the liquid state, you may be making them move faster, but they're all moving faster relative to one another where they can all have that intermolecular attraction. But whenever you change something into steam, you are breaking the intermolecular forces that are holding them together and giving it enough energy to escape gravity. So that's why this energy is so significantly bigger than this one. The last question says you have a blacksmith who's making a new axe for a customer. Um, it's made out of iron and was heated to 1500 C in order to shape. What will be the final temperature of the axe after it's plunged into a 100 kilograms tub of water? So the first thing you need to realize is we're going to have two sides of this equation. We're going to have the axe and we're going to have the water. So the axe is 5 kilograms. It has a specific heat of 460. And it's change in temperature. I don't know the final temperature, but I know the initial temperature is going to be 1500 C. Now, as far as the water is concerned, I know that the mass of the water is 100 kilograms. I know the specific heat is 4184. And I know that the change in temperature is going to be some final temperature minus 23. Now, once you realize, I'm going to add another slide here. Um, once you realize that these two final temperatures are the same, now the reason why these two final temperatures are the same is because um, they're going to have the same final temperature. They're going to reach what's called thermal equilibrium with one another. So now what I can say is I can actually set these equal to each other by saying that the heat that is lost by the axe is the heat that is gained by the water. Oh, another way of saying that is minus Q is equal to positive Q. Or minus Cm delta T is equal to positive Cm delta T. And now you can plug your numbers in. Minus 5 times 460 times Tf minus 1500 equals uh, 4184 times 100 times Tf minus 23. <clears throat> when you do that, now you need to multiply out and you need to distribute. Be very, very careful when you multiply this out because you're distributing in a negative sign. When you distribute the negative sign, you end up getting minus 2300 TF plus uh, 69, and then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, so that comma is actually in the wrong place, equals, you would have 4, 1, Eight four zero 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 TF minus, and this is going to be a big number two, nine six two three two zero zero. Now, you would solve for TF using algebra, and when you solve for TF, you should get something like twenty four point five degrees Celsius. Now you'll notice that the temperature of the water didn't change much, and it didn't change much for two reasons. Number one, there was more mass. Number two, the specific heat was about 10 times more. So it takes about 10 times the energy to change the temperature of water than it does to change the temperature of iron.